great visitors uh, Suman, Ariel. Now we have Kesha who is uh, very shortly passing through Paris and uh, accepted to give a private class for us. This <laughs> is not the Wednesday's official seminars, so it's not as crowded as uh, it used to be. But nevertheless, it's, it's really great. I'm not going to introduce Kesha. Maybe for the young uh, PhD, they believe uh, it doesn't exist, but uh, he is. Uh, starting very early on different topics. I remember the time, for instance, of uh, you talking about virtualization, and now it's like uh, huge, as many of the things that you have done. And today we are very lucky because he's going to talk about uh, blockchains and how you can scale it. In the meantime, he has worked also a lot on the, the smart grid, just to show that uh, not only it's very deep on the foundation of networking, but also he has always been very interested by uh, application and how this will uh, really be in a position to happen in the market. So Keshav, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Sresh. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I always start my talk by saying thank you for being here. If I were you, I'd be all enjoying Paris. <laughs> <laughs> but you chose to be here, so thank you very much. I hope that uh, you learn something from this. Uh, this work is with uh, Sajad Rizvi, who's a student uh, jo jointly supervised with Bernard Wong, my colleague, and uh, Wojciech Golab and Sergey Gobinov, who are my colleagues at, uh, at Waterloo. And um, so anyway, so let me just dive right in and talk, just give you like a, <laughs> where is Waterloo anyway, right? <laughs> Most people don't know where is it. So if this is sort of North America, and that end over there, you can see sort of the east coast of the United States. So over there, if you zoom into the rectangle over there, you kind of see this uh, part of Canada which jumps into the United States. Most of Canada is above the United States, but this part is, is below the southern. It's a Florida of Canada. It's the warmest part. It only goes to minus 20 degrees in winter, not minus. And, and in that triangle, in the center of it is this Kitchener, and, and next to it is Waterloo, which is this little, small, little town. And, and the university is at sort of the middle of that university over there. So that's sort of where it is. And I have to, I mean, I was, why is the thing cut off? Interesting, interesting. OK. Well, we'll see if there's going to be a problem later on. Should I change the definition, I think? It's a, ah, OK, I can try doing that. Uh -huh. OK, so that was the advertisement for Faculty of Math, which I should <laughs> skip anyway. Um, so now they at least know where it's Waterloo. It's Waterloo. And uh, now I have to... For us, you know, Waterloo has a different... Uh, <laughs> this, your Waterloo? Uh, let's just say it was settled by the British, so they have a... <laughs> uh, I don't even know how to change the resolution. Let me just continue with this and see whether it leads to a problem later on. It might not be a problem. Uh, I'm just going to skip this part on Faculty of Mathematics because it was... Uh, Let's just, uh, it was uh, great. <laughs> now what? Uh, I have something here, but not there. It's not you, Kesha. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's the protector there. I must have done something to it. I already said about Waterloo. So I can tell you a story. So there are two towns, Kitchener and Waterloo. Kitchener's former name was Berlin. It was settled by the Germans. And in the First World War, they decided to find the most right-wing extremist British politician they could find, which was Kitchener. And so they changed the town from Berlin to Kitchener. And Waterloo was uh, settled by the British, so of course this was anti-French. So, they, so they, both the Germans and the French should be upset with Kitchener-Waterloo. <laughs> It's maximally bad. <laughs> uh, OK, I'm going to skip some slides so then I can save some time. Should I unplug here and replug? Maybe that will uh, sync no. up. We need to do a feature of green again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it's green. Okay. It's full green. Okay, now something is going to happen. 
Well, there's markers and whiteboards, so I can use that. <laughs> so. Okay, something is happening. I didn't change the resolution, actually. I, I don't know how to do it, honestly. Oh, no, wait, I can't do it. Display settings, no. Mm. OK, all right. Yeah. I'm not going to change anything. This is OK. So I'm going to talk about consensus, what, what is it, why it's important, and then a protocol called Canopus. And I'll give you a hint about something called Resilient Canopus, which is the work I've been doing more recently. So what's consensus? Let's say we have a bunch of different systems, one, two, and three. And they both, they're all trying to write to some kind of key value store. Okay, so here you have key, and they, this one wants to write a value one, they want to write value two, they're going to write value three. And at some point in the future, they're going to read the value. And the question is, what value are they going to read? You know, if, if, you know obviously they have conf conflicts on the right value. And so the whole point of consensus, uh, or one way of presenting it anyway, is to get agreement on the value that is read. And of course, as you can see, in this way, if you present it, it's an ordering problem. If you put this right before this right and that right at the end, then the, everybody should be reading the value three, if you, assuming all the writes complete before the reads are started. Right? So the problem with this is, so, so this is, in, in the context of a key value store, basically it becomes an agreement on the order of the writes. You just have to agree on which, where the writes happen. And so we can think of it like this. This is the key value store. What you're going to do over here is <clears throat> we're going to take a bunch of keys, which can be like an account number. And you're going to have a value, which could be a transaction ID or transaction type, things like that. And you're going to give it a key value server. And <clears throat> these writes are going to be put into a, what we call a proposed block of writes. And then I'm going to get something called consensus, which is this thing over here. At the end of it, I get what I call a stable block. It's an agreement between all the entities on the order of the rights, and then that gets into some stable storage. So, so you can see that in order for this key value store to be globally consistent, for everybody to agree on the values, it's important that all the rights happen in the same order, and that's what the consensus system is going to, is going to enforce, basically. All right, so before I move on, I want to make two observations. First, please feel, to, feel free to stop me at any time. I'm happy to explain whatever I went through. And second, uh, is this framework reasonably comp and understandable? I mean, because I can explain this a bit more if, if anybody's not familiar with key value stores or things like that. OK. All right, OK. So moving on, why is this hard? You know, why is this such a big deal? The main problem is it comes from geographical distribution when you have latency. Inter-server latencies can be quite high. So imagine a situation where we have three servers. One is here, one is in Toronto, one is down in Florida. And we're going to do these writes. So this may do a write. And then this may do a write at, quote, unquote, the same time. But this write is not going to be known for at least 20 milliseconds. So for 20 milliseconds, this write is not known. And of course, that doesn't know about the writes either. So even if there's a static, a static temporal ordering on the writes, if the read happens immediately over here, you do a write and then read immediately after that, uh, it doesn't even know that this write happened it's because of speed of light latency. Moreover, any message that's being sent from here to there could be lost. And we could have duplicate messages. So we have this issue of the high inter-server latency. Servers may crash, so you may do a write followed by a crash. Then you can have messages that can get lost, and servers may get hacked. So for example, this server may tell that server, I wrote a 1, and says over here, I wrote a 2. It may lie, because it got hacked. And that's what's, that's what's called Byzantine failure. So I'm not going to go into any details of Byzantine fault tolerance in this talk. I'm just going to assume that if Byzantine fault tolerance system exists, you'll see that later. But dealing with this is quite complicated, and this has been a subject of research for the last 50 years. Right? All right, so let's look at classical consensus, how it's done. A typical example is something called the Apache Zookeeper service. And the way it works is actually very straightforward. Here are a bunch of clients that all want to get their rights in some order, and they'll send their values to a server, which are these key value servers I talked to you earlier. And the servers elect a leader. And leader election is done using any number of well-known protocols. These are extremely well-known. And the leader then gets all the information and says, OK, this is the order of the rights. So because there's only one leader, 
uh, obviously you get uh, you get uh, serial ordering, which is which is unique, and everybody knows what it is, and then you're done. So you so here's the right and so on. The problem with this is that the single leader limits the scalability. We can't really, uh, these are what are called the followers, so the, everything has to go through a leader, so it becomes a single point of failure and a single point of traffic concentration. And so if the leader fails, it can take quite a long time to re-elect the leader. So this kind of system doesn't work geographically scales in a scaling way. It, even in a single data center, a zookeeper would typically be used for, low lat for high latency, low, low throughput type of applications. So the other way of doing consensus is basically what is pioneered by Bitcoin or, or by Nakamoto, who were, or whoever Nakamoto is. And the idea is kind of straightforward. You know, in the same, if we were to put it in this context, it's like saying, I have a bunch of keys which go to the blockchain server, which is similar to key value server, they create proposed blocks, and then we have a mining race. So everybody is going to try and essentially invert or find a pre-image of a hash. And whoever wins is going to be saying, this is the stable block. We define the stable block. And so consensus becomes a, 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 a random uh, selection of a leader. Rather than everybody going to the leader, the leader gets randomly chosen based on the mining race. And the beauty of this is that by doing proof of work, it means that overturning the leader's decision becomes impossible after a certain period of time, after about six blocks or one hour. It's computationally infeasible to overturn the leader. So whatever a leader says is going to happen. So we have a, a, a stochastic leader selection, or random leader selection through the mining race, followed by the, uh, followed by the uh, uh, use of proof of work. So I'm not going to go into Bitcoin at all. So if this didn't make sense to you, don't worry. The rest of the talk is not going to refer to this at all. All I'm trying to show here is that uh, consensus, uh, uh, even uh, Bitcoin consensus can be viewed in this lens in, in, in a sort of a unified way, which is a kind of a nice way of thinking about it. The big problem with blockchain today is that there is this trade-off between the scalability, number of nodes, and, and the throughput, actually, or the latency, as you, uh, this is actually, this chart is from Marko Vukulic's paper, and he confuses latency and throughput, which is sad, but anyway, this should be throughput. Because <laughs> you kind of neglect latency in transactions per second, that's a wrong value. But the big, big message is that if you have more and more nodes, you can't really, ha you have very few transactions per second. So in, in Bitcoin, you have potentially tens of thousands of nodes. However, you can only do about seven transactions per second. And if you go to the fewer nodes, about 20 nodes, then you can get you know, uh, more throughput, about 10,000 transactions per second uh, with the Byzantine fault tolerant protocols, BFTs, Byzantine fault tolerant protocols in the permission setting. Uh, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Is transaction kind of well-defined in the sense that uh, you know, in, in the unit of quantity? I'm not using transaction in the database sense. A transaction for me is a right a key value right. So uh, in, 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 in a blockchain world, sort of the, the uh, you can think of it as a smart contract as a transaction, or uh, a transfer of funds in Bitcoin would be a transaction. But is it uniform across all the systems when you're saying that? Yeah, because all of them are trying to solve similar problems, which is, uh, again, I'm viewing this in the lens of a key value store, uh, rights to a key value yeah, store. Sure. And any other? Yeah. So the, the way we'd like to be is sort of on the top right corner. We'd like to have lots of nodes and higher throughput. And basically, the purpose of this talk is to show you how to do it and how, 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 we, how we think we can do it. So our goals are to have high throughput. We want to get a million transactions per second. We can't do that. We can do more than a million in some settings. We can do less than a million in other settings. We want to scale to thousands of nodes. We want to be pluggable into existing permission blockchains such as Hyperledger Fabric, and I'm not going to talk about this, but I can answer lots of questions about this. And we want to be both Byzantine failure and network partition fault tolerant. And I can add that at this point, no system today actually meets all these goals, including ours. Ours doesn't get to a million. We get to somewhat less than that. Okay. So now I'm going to ask just a very simple thought experiment. I'm going to change the topic completely and just kind of ask you a very simple question. Let's say there's six people or six nodes that each have a number, right? Each have a value, yeah. I have a small question. Yes. Um, you uh, present the problem as a distributed key value. Yes, yes. store, so, correct. Uh, what is the difference, let's say, compared to router over the internet, exchanging routes yes. over the internet, let's say, via BGP yeah. or uh, 
for instance, uh, with a cluster of uh, SQL server, yes. for example. Yeah. So in what sense the problem that you are trying to solve is uh, different? And why could, couldn't we use uh, such yeah. designs? Yeah. So the, the question, I guess, has to do with why can't we use BGP or uh, just a distributed database to solve this problem? Yeah. Uh, Typical distributed databases are not Byzantine fault tolerant or network partition tolerant, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a distributed database angle because they're, they're not they're not Byzantine fault tolerant. We don't. I, I'm not aware of any distributed databases that are just Byzantine fault tolerant. Okay. In terms of network routing, the the important thing here is in network routing we want to get high low latency, mm -hmm. and here we're focusing on high throughput. And if you look at BGP in particular, it's actually essentially the hard problem there is the policy computation. How do you make sure that the distributed routes are actually obeying a certain set of policies and we're following the appropriate sort of up, down, path, and so on? Those kind of constraints don't exist over here. So here we're focusing on throughput rather than latency. Okay. <clears throat> and, and in BGP, we have a lot of issues of hiding. We want uh, uh, autonomous systems don't want to reveal the internals. They just want to export certain routes and so on. We don't have any of those issues over here. Mm -hmm. So the problems, I mean, at a broad level, you're doing a computation of a global function, you know, which is a complicated function. But I, I was doing the reference to BGP because even if you have a malicious uh, autonomous system, yes, say, yes. Uh, providing a faulty route, yes. uh, the other uh, uh, autonomous system could select other routes or filter out. Yes, yes, but the way it's done with SBGP is to use just to uh, have a central secure key, uh, TLS based solution. Here we don't have that necessarily. I mean, there are, we will use TLS to some extent, but uh, yeah, but the performance goals are different. Yeah. Okay. All right, so. So again, let's come back. We want to take you know, six, the six people in this room. They each have a number. I want to compute the sum. Okay, how, how would you do that? A star architecture, ten messages. Uh, sorry, what? Uh, a, a star. A star, a tree. Yeah. Yeah. So something like this. You do a tree. So you have six nodes, D, E, F, G, H, and I. And so these guys are one, six, four. They are five, three, two. We get three helper nodes, A, B, and C. And A, B computes the partial sum from here. C computes the partial sum from here, and then tell the root which is A, which computes those two sums, and then we tell everybody. So two log n steps, everybody knows everything, right? And this could be viewed as, as rights to a key value store. Right? But okay, how about this? We can get rid of the helper nodes. We can say, okay, D can be the person in charge of this set, G can be in charge of this set over here, and D is going to be the root node as well. So we don't need any helper nodes. A, B, C, go away, right? No problem? Now I'll do one more trick, which is that I'll say that all nodes are going to emulate all ancestors. So what the heck does that mean? Okay. So D, E, and F are going to tell D something, which is the partial sum 11. What if the partial sum was communicated to E and F as well? That means D, E, and F all know the partial sum. Similarly, G, H, and I all know the partial sum 10. Now, if the partial sum from here was sent here, and they did some local communication. Then everybody knows the grandparent's value, which is 21. Is that clear? So all of them can be asked, what is your grandparent's value? And so on up to the root. So what's happening is that we are essentially creating an overlay architecture of this tree, where we're doing local communication one fetch, and then some local communication. I'll explain that in a minute much more. But that's basically the conceptual idea over here. OK? So, so we call this group a superleaf. And what we do is we put all the nodes in the same rack in a data center in a superleaf, like this. So DE and F are going to be the same rack. And we use an intra-superleaf consensus protocol over here to do ordering of rights and so on. I'll do an example in a minute. We'll show you this. And so they know the local order, and they do the local order here. And then we're going to merge these local orders into a total order. And that way, you'll get global ordering. Okay, That's the idea. And so let's, let's see how that works. So the way it works is that we're going to do a local broadcast using any broadcast that you want. And for those of you who are in the distributed system space, you know that local broadcast, atomic broadcast is the same as consensus, So which is local consensus. But it's being done in a very t simple environment, just in a rack. No, no, your, your latencies are well known. You can use almost any protocol you want for local consensus over here. 
And then you go and say, what's your local order? You share it, and then you go fishing, you pick, get the value back, we tell them again, that's what the other people had, and now everybody knows everything. Okay? But here it's not scalable. Yeah. I mean, with that, your rocks are fixed. It's not scalable, why? Uh, because you do consensus on all that. You do consensus within the rack. But, well, yes, but it's, it's a consensus on top of a group of members that are known from the beginning. They know each other. Yes, they know so each other. membership is known. It's known, exactly. Okay. Yes, absolutely. At this point, it's not scalable. Uh, but no, so, so uh, permission blockchains, you do have the knowledge of all the other nodes. Yeah, so this is for a permission blockchain, okay. not for a private blockchain, a public blockchain, so private only, yeah. So, yeah. So, because you mentioned scalability. Scalability is the number of transactions, not in the, oh, okay. yeah, but also number of nodes, but we do know who they are. We do know who they are. This is not going to work for public blockchain, yeah. Okay. yeah. So in, you are in the, in a permission in setting, permission completely setting. in a permission setting. The number of Yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. Sorry. Yes, this is completely in the context of permission, permission blockchains only. Yeah, yeah. But even there, the fastest speed we're seeing is about thousand transactions a second. Uh, that's what Fabric is able to do. At least that's the best I've seen so far. Thousand. Red Belly is doing better. Which one? Red Belly. Red Belly claims to be doing better, but uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, yes, but. The, the, we can take this off the mat. I haven't seen a, a paper or, you know, published in a peer-reviewed conference of a journal or something like that. They just have a website saying we can do it faster. But uh, yeah, we, we... They just published in ACA. They did? Okay, I didn't see that. Okay, I should definitely follow up with you. That's why I brought a notebook. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I can... That's why I give these talks so people can tell me I'm wrong. It's always a good thing. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so, so what we're doing over here is this, uh, this is local broadcast and fishing I talked about. And so we get what we call a leaf-only tree, where basically uh, there's the tree only exists at the leaves. And <clears throat> these nodes all emulate their parents, and the root is emulated by all the leaves. That's basically what's going on. And by design, it's load balanced, because I can go to any node over here and ask it for its parents' values. And it's fault tolerant, because even if this node fails, I can go to some other node. So we get all these, quote unquote, for, for free. So to summarize what I've said so far, we have a tree where the internal nodes are virtual, the leaf nodes emulate all the internal nodes, and we have this clustering of nodes called a super leaf, which is physically tied to, to, to a rack. Okay, so what does that have to do with consensus? Okay, so let's take a look at the Canopus consensus protocol. So what we do is basically we do consensus in a series of rounds. So in the first round, we do consensus here and in parallel over here, and then the second round, we do consensus between these groups. Okay, so let's take an example and show you how this works. So let's say that A gets a transaction A1, B gets a transaction B1, C gets two transactions C1 and C2, and we want to get, and these are right transactions. Okay, we don't need to worry about reads, we'll talk about reads in a minute. What we'll do is, we will exploit inside the rack, this is inside a rack, we'll exploit that it's a low latency environment where the latencies are bounded so we can use Reliable broadcast or raft, any protocol that we want really. <coughs> we use raft actually. Sorry, and sorry. yeah, sorry. Excuse me. So you assume a synchronous communication? Inside a rack, yes. Okay. Inside a rack, synchronous is a reasonable assumption. And you said that you start in parallel in another rack? In the other rack, yeah. But, but you're talking about how, the, how does the timing work? I'll show that in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So let's just stay with the example. What we'll do first is we'll attach random numbers to each of the transactions, like 634, 746, 538. And then what we do is we just then uh, broadcast it. And so everybody gets these proposals to each other, and then we just sort them, and we get the same order. Now the rights are in the same order, and everybody knows the order. In, inside a rack, in a single rack. Just sorted based on the... Just sorted based on random number, just no, nothing, nothing complicated. And then once you do this, this makes the first round happen. At the end of the first round, there is a partial order that's been established on these transactions, and everybody knows what they are. So now what we do is we have these two racks, and they've started their work. We elect over here something called a representative. We do leader election, we elect a representative, and all of these nodes emulate, they all know the partial order, so they all emulate the virtual node over there. And we send a request over here with a proposal request saying, please give me a partial order. It comes back with the aggregated response. And now, basically, we have some set of values here, some set of values there. We just need to go, one goes before the other. 
That's all we need to know which one goes before the other, right? Because we, 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 we can just do that. And uh, when you do this, we tell everybody what the partial orders, what the aggregated value is, were, and they were red and blue, not they become purple, right? They all know the values of each other. And at this point, they all know the value of the root. So do they all go uh, in one, I mean, the one group goes first and the second group goes second? That's correct, so yeah, yeah, we don't so interleave. There's no, no interleaving, that's important because in fact, as you can see over here, because there's no interleaving, we only need to worry about our own reads because let's say this is my block over here. I know that my block of writes was the second one in the ordering and I know where my reads were. I just keep that to myself. By just knowing the ordering of the writes, I know what values to return to the reads. So by just simply keeping track of my writes, I, can, I don't need to share reads. And if you look at a protocol like ePaxSource, which is egalitarian source, which does this kind of thing, there they have to share all the reads. And we don't need to share reads at all. We can do everything. Now about timing. <coughs> it's actually self-synchronizing. The reason is because, uh, let us say that this group had not done its local, over here, local uh, consensus. And it got a proposal request saying, please give me your local value for cycle number 2034. It says, oh, I'm still on 2033. I don't have 2034 done yet. Wait. You keep waiting until it does that cycle, and then it'll send a response back. So it becomes self-synchronizing. There is no global time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this is, this is basically, that's basically Canopus in a, in a, in a nutshell. That's what, I mean, so the idea is, Actually quite simple, and uh, I should add that the, the basic idea of having this distributed uh, trees and local com computations was something I did with a postdoc in 2005, a guy called Andrea Alavena, and we had a very difficult time publishing our paper in 2005 because we said this is for multi data center synchronization. And in 2005, the first question we got was, what is the data center? And second, why do we want to do multi-data center? We don't even know what a data center is. So we just published a tech report and we did nothing. And then 2015, we went back to it and said, oh, we can use this protocol for, for consensus. So now people know what a data center is. For, you know, 2005 was a bit unknown. Um, but uh, this protocol, the basic idea is what we have over here. It, it, there's a lot of things that are missing and uh, I'm going to uh, kind of hint at two of them, but one thing we did do was to do a proof. So if you look up the paper, it was published in Conex last year. We do have a theorem which shows that at the end of these log n consensus rounds, all live nodes have the same set of messages, but only live nodes, right? If, if, if there's any problem that happens, if there's a rack failure or a partitioning, basically the whole thing stalls. Nothing, it doesn't make progress. And so, so that's basically what, that's the, the trick that we're using. The trick is that, let us say this sends a message over here and, and that's not reachable, right? Then, then you can't make progress. You're just stuck there saying, I can't make progress. So we are basically relying on the fact that inter-data center communication today is pretty reliable, right? And that entire data centers, entire racks don't typically fail. And, and so in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about how to overcome that using this resilient canopus. But basically for this canopus, this is what we have over here. And so the network model now becomes pretty straightforward. What we do is that we, this is a typical data center. We'll put one superleaf here, maybe another superleaf over there. We'll have the calculation over here. And then we put other data centers around the world. We form a hierarchy of these data centers. And that gives us the, the, the properties that we want. And going to just spend a couple of minutes on sort of performance. We did this, implemented this in seven data centers around the world. This is, I think, Virginia, California, Tokyo, Sydney, Frankfurt, places like that. This is a inter data center latencies, which are as low as well. In, within the data center, you're getting about 0 0.2 milliseconds, but very far data centers can be as far as 320 milliseconds apart. And I want to show you only one performance analysis, which is comparison, comparison of Canopus versus ePaxos, assuming no rack failure, no network partitioning. And on the x-axis, basically, I'm showing the number of millions of transactions per second I can show, which is the kind of the throughput. And the y-axis is the median latency in, in milliseconds. So it's the throughput latency, right? Normally, what happens is you increase the throughput, at some point, you hit the system performance wall, and then your delay keeps going straight up. That's your throughput 
delay curve. That's exactly what we see over here. There's a throughput over here, and it kind of goes up. So with EPAC source, the initial latency for low throughput actually is lower than Canopus. That's because it doesn't have multiple rounds of computation. But once we push past, we get to about two and a half million transactions per second. Uh, so EPAC source stops at about 0 0.7 million. We can go up to about 2.4 million transactions per second, globally distributed. Right? This is an actual measurement. What's more interesting is when we get to 21 nodes, this is nine nodes here, 21 nodes globally, basically there are about 4.7 trans million transactions per second. Whereas uh, EPAC source goes down from 0 0.7 down to about 0 0.2 over here. And so, so that's the, the our, our actually our scaling is going up. As we add more nodes, we're getting more and more things happening in parallel. And uh, so the other trick we're using over here, which I, I will mention, is that we also do something which is very obvious in computer networking, but is not exploited in distributed systems, which is windowing, right? To show that, I mean, if you have over here um, this, we have a, let's say you ask a proposal message, this is in Tokyo, and that one is in, let's say, I don't know, uh, San Francisco. That message is going to go across the Pacific very slowly and then come back. While this is going on for cycle number one, you can also send the next message for cycle two, and that's going to go across. And as long as you keep the cycle numbers distinct and you carry that in the header, you can actually have multiple parallel consensus cycles in, uh, going on at the same time. And this gives you very high throughput. So we can overcome all the inter data center latencies by doing careful pipelining. And in fact, our pipelines are 50 cycles deep. We actually have 50 deep pipelines for this whole thing to work properly. And, and this is something that, again, is a kind, kind of obvious thing from networking that is not really used in distributed systems. So without this, we can't perform that well. But with this, <clears throat> we get really good performance. So to summarize, what we can do with Canopus today is this consensus among a very large number of participants, not Byzantine fault tolerant, but it, it's decentralized. It's designed for modern data centers because it assumes that you don't have partitioning and, and, and failures. We have this notion of aggregated results or partial aggregations which should get composed up, and we use batching and pipelining to overcome the WAN uh, latencies. We have multiple consensus instances. Um, in flight at the same time. So that's sort of the sketch, and all the details are in this paper, which is in Conext uh, last December. And so I'm going to take a couple of minutes to you know, pause and take any questions, and then after that, I'll talk about how we can deal with Byzantine failures, which is the resilient canopus part. So any questions so far? I'm assuming this hierarchy can be arbitrary. Arbitrarily, yeah. Yeah, one of the open questions is, so how should the hierarchy be made? I, I, we don't have an answer to that. That's actually a nice open question, how to, how to create the hierarchy. You mean, like, Ma mapping the hierarchy. In each level, or? Yeah, they don't all have to be the same degree. It's arbitrary degree. Where, where should the, where should the, what should the hierarchy look like is, yeah, it's, it's, it's I don't know. I don't know the answer. Is, is latency going to be a factor there, or is it more computation cost that makes? It's a, uh, it's a throughput actually, not the latency. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's the trade-off? Well, the trade-off here is that the more the um, levels in the hierarchy, the uh, uh, less kind of fishing you need to do. But then the overall latency goes higher and higher, obviously, right? Uh, and then also the the less bushy it is the less parallelism there is. You want to make it as bushy as possible. So it's, uh, yeah, so you want to exploit all the parallelism, right, as much as you can, uh, and without giving up on latency and uh, to match the, uh, I'm waving my hands because we haven't really formalized it, but I think it's an, inter it's an, interesting, it's an interesting problem. I don't have a good, I don't even know how to formalize I mean, I haven't spent any time talking, thinking about the formalism yet, but I think it's a good problem to think about, yeah. Remembers the uh, data structure that uh, has been used uh, also in computer networks. Okay. But that comes from database systems. Okay. R trees. R trees. Okay. R trees. Okay. And I think that uh, it's very similar to what you would like to have. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I'm familiar with virtual binary trees, which is some work done in database systems about 2004. So, uh, 
or the virtual binary tree? I see. Okay. I'll look into that. Thank you. And in fact, if you're not to say they already have this kind of R tree based overlays used on basically on public subscribe systems. Okay. For field training. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, I can see that, yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, have they been used for consensus? Not, not, not for, for consensus, consensus. So it would be a smart, uh, smart... Uh, right, and do they also do pipelining? No. Yeah, no, no, no. okay, I would think... It's, yeah. it's, a, it's an overlay network. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Right. But this is also an overlay network, actually. It's a structured yeah. overlay network, yeah. but it, with pipelining. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's what gives us the throughput, actually. Yeah. Okay, let me move on then to this uh, the failure model. So, Canopus supports basically crash stop failures, and what I'm going to talk about next is is R Canopus. And so, uh, <clears throat> R Canopus is complex because any system that does fault tolerance for network partitioning and Byzantine is has to be complex. It's a very complicated things to deal with, and. Um, I should add that the version I'm presenting to you, I'm going to sketch to you, is the 20th version of the protocol. So I was on sabbatical this year, I'm, and I'm, I'm about to finish. And this is what I spent all my time doing. So I came with the protocol, and my colleagues told me, you're wrong, and why I was wrong. And then I'd come with another version, and tell me again. So I went back to being a grad student, which was a lot of fun. And, and so now this protocol, we all feel confident that it's, it's correct. Uh, we haven't formally proved it yet, but we feel pretty confident. At least I'm fed up with proving, uh, prove, <laughs> I'm fed up coming with a new version. I, I really can't find any flaws with it. Anyway, the, some key ideas that we use, one is this notion of a synchronous intra superleaf environment. So we already talked about the fact that in a single rack, we know what the delay bound is. If I send a message from one server to another, I'd better get a response back within, I don't know, 30 microseconds, 40 microseconds. Otherwise, the other node is dead. There's no reason for it to not respond. So we can set a loose bound some value. And once you do that, we immediately get a synchronous environment, and that means that we can use any, almost any protocol for, for atomic broadcast or consensus, and it's going to work, because we can set timeouts reliably. And that, that makes life much easier. So we'll make that assumption again from before that's a synchronous interest, and we use Zookeeper actually for the local uh, consensus, so just because it's convenient. The second thing we do, and this is very critical, is we have to somehow figure out how to deal with Byzantine failures. And so uh, many different blockchains have come up with different ideas on how to do Byzantine failure, failures. I'm not going to discuss those. I'll just tell you what we assume. And I'll tell you the idea model first, and then it's sort of just using my words. And then you can see how it maps to what I've written over here. Imagine that in Paris, there are five, 10 cloud service providers. You know, you have Microsoft, you have Azure from Microsoft, you have Amazon, you have, you know, whatever, France, Dell. Right? You have these. What is the attack vector for somebody to break into a distributed system, right? If I put one rack in each of these cloud service providers, the attack vector is going to be somebody to break into Microsoft, and then they're going to break into your servers after that. That's how they're going to do it, right? So we have this geographically constrained notion of a Byzantine group. So we'll say all the nodes, all the cloud service providers in Paris from different entities will form a Byzantine group. And no more than F of these will be attacked simultaneously. F is like one or maybe two, right? So if Azure gets attacked, it's not going to be attacked as somewhere else. So what we're doing is we're basically concretizing the Byzantine. Just that we concretize the, the abstract graph into racks and data centers. You're going to concretize the attack vector into somebody getting into Azure and attacking your servers there. And we're making the assumption that the attack vector that they're going to use, which is going to be essentially through, through the back door, is not going to be attacking anybody else. It's not going to be attacking any of the other things. So we can form the super lease into a Byzantine group. All right? This Byzantine group is going to have up to F failures. But once we get enough signatures from the members of the Byzantine group, for the rest of the hierarchy, we are clean. We can't be hacked anymore, because we already got the fault tolerance. right? And so we have sort of this layered approach. In the lowest layer, we do a synchronous consensus. The next layer, we do Byzantine fault tolerance consensus. The layer above that, we do Canopus, which gives us total orders based on these signatures. So that's the, that's the idea. That's a key idea here. 
And then the rest of it is details. I mean, there are many details, but for example, we need to form a global membership service to know who are the emulators for each Byzantine group, and if people join and leave. So we do, in fact, handle the joining and leaving problem in Arkhan office. So you can have nodes join and leave, Byzantine groups join and leave, et cetera. So it's not completely static. Only within the rack, it's static. And even there, we can use this. There are some details I can go into, but we do have that. And then the other thing is the pipelining, which gives us the, gives us the throughput that we need. Okay. All right, so let me show a little bit about how this works. And again, I'm going to sketch it because there's a lot of details here. We're going to use a topology of a node organization where these squares represent racks of servers, and these are the servers over here. So the nodes are these orange ones over here. And we have this notion of a broker who is the, what I showed you earlier in the key value store. These are the people getting requests to do something. For example, it could be an insurance company or a bank or somebody who's been given requests to do something, or, or a hospital right, who's been given requests. So they're aggregating up all the requests and they're taking part in the consensus, uh, global consensus. And the way they do it is the broker owns one or more super leaves in one or more data centers. So you can say, this super leaf belongs to you know, bank number one, this belongs to bank number two, et cetera, and they own a rack, and inside the rack they're doing something. And then this set of nodes which are in different data centers in the same area are going to be forming a Byzantine group. So in fact, I'll show this over here. So this is a super leaf, and this set of super leaves in this dashed blue line is forming the Byzantine group. Now, only F of these can be attacked. So let's say F is one, so only one can be attacked. And then we can use, essentially, any kind of Byzantine fault tolerant protocol that we want to, to get this to be Byzantine fault tolerant in the, in the order of what they do, on, 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 uh, of the work that they do, okay? So, of course, what this also means that client transactions cannot go to just one broker. The client has to send a request to multiple brokers who are going to be in different cloud providers so that if one of them gets hacked, we'll still make progress. And then we'll get duplicates and we have to take care of that, but that's not hard. Okay. Once you get this, so the, 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 again, the innovation here is to say the Byzantine groups are geographically constrained. And so we can get Byzantine fault tolerance without paying the two, 300 millisecond latencies. We're going to pay five millisecond, maybe something like that, latencies for inter, inter data center communication within the same geographical area, right? And then after you get the hierarchy. Um, I'll take one more, I'll do one more thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause for questions. So the next thing we're gonna do is that we're gonna basically elect one Byzantine group leader, uh, sorry, uh, uh, for, from each Byzantine group, we elect a, a, a uh, a leader, and then these guys form a global service which we'll need for a few things. So the elected node from each super leaf participates in the Byzantine group. So this Byzantine group is formed inside the super leaves, and they form a leader, and then the leaders will then form this, this global service. That's the, uh, okay, so, all right, so I'm gonna stop here. And we'll, okay, and so let's see how this, sort of this global group as well. Okay, so let me stop here, and then are there, are there any questions about this, about this so far? How do you access the geographic position if all the nodes are virtualized? That's one provider. Oh, okay, I see, I see. So, um, <clears throat> the, uh, we don't have any virtual nodes ever. It's just we organize the, the, okay, so let me answer it slightly differently. All the nodes that are on the same rack are form a super leaf, and that's geographically localized in the same rack, okay? The, the next level, we need to take certain number of super leaves, which are close by, and call them a Byzantine group. There we have to balance between the probability of an attack versus the performance degradation, right? So if I say all the nodes are in Paris, then maybe that's opening possibly of too much attack. So they'll say, no, I'll put all of France in one Byzantine group, but then I have to pay more for my inter data center traffic for the Byzantine group consensus algorithm, the Byzantine fault tolerant consensus. The rest of it is just this phishing that I talked about. I'm going to go fish from here and say, give me your signed certificate for your partial agreement, and here's mine, and then we do a merging of the two, just like an office. And that, at that point, we can actually do all of them in parallel. We can go to all the other Byzantine groups in the world and just ask them, 
upfront what, what they have. And then we can do the ordering uh, actually post hoc. It's a bit complicated, but just think of it as saying, geography doesn't play too much of a role anymore once you got the Byzantine group done. Yeah. What happens for um, uh, consensus within all these transactions happening? Is there this, uh, disagreements, and is that not an issue at all? Oh, right. So the, so the thing is, if you view the key value store, yeah. the key value store, we only have an ordering of rights. So then we don't need any more consensus beyond that. Because I have the ordering of rights, and I know the ordering of the reads and the rights. So I know that my read happened after the second write, for example, then I know what value I got. As long as everybody agrees on the ordering of the rights and they know where their own reads are, they know what values they're going to return. Yeah. Now, of course, you have the issue of a, of a particular node that could be Byzantine, and then it's returning a wrong value. That's where the client has to participate in f plus 1. Uh, actually, you know, two f plus one uh, values, so that it gets enough values back, so it knows what the right value is. Okay. Any? Yeah. Sorry. Basically, what you want to achieve is a total order of the rights. Correct. No total order of all the operations. Oh, oh, yeah. The, the reads are done with local, just local. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, you don't want to have the linearizability. You want to have just to emulate just a regular register, if I understand well. This is going to be uh, serializable. Okay. It's, a fully, it's fully serializable. It depends. We can, if you share the reads, then it can be linearizable. But here, it's serializable. I, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but my student who did all this stuff tells me it's serializable, but not linearizable. So if you don't want to have an atomic register, in that case, you don't want I don't need consensus. Well, I, don't, I think that you don't need consensus because you need consensus in order to implement an atomic register. But what you want to emulate here is not an atomic register, it's mm -hmm. something weaker. Because you don't want to have uh, a specific order on the local reads. That's correct. I don't, I, I, any order is acceptable. That's correct. However, I, everybody needs to know what the order is. The consensus is an agreement on what the ordering is, as opposed to agreement on this for all the operations. For all the operations. For all the so here you have something weaker. So I think that you can solve your problem mm -hmm. with a weaker abstraction than consensus. Um, so this problem is actually basically log replication is what you're doing. It's not even exactly consensus. This is log replication is what we're doing. We're creating a particular log order. And everybody sharing a log order for blockchain. That's all we need. We don't need uh, we don't need a proposal accept kind of consensus, which would be the classical consensus. But it, but but. Uh, yeah, but when people use consensus in the blockchain, they want to have a single blockchain, not a forty-one. That's why they use consensus. But we're still going to get a single blockchain because these are going to tell you the uh, just like in. Uh, Bitcoin, the leader can choose the transaction order any order they want. But in the permission blockchain, also the ordering is uh, arbitrary. So we have actually this fits completely into Fabric, for example. There, the order has complete control over the choice of the order. It's uh, there is, uh, I mean, all orderings are valid within a, within a block. All orderings are valid. So here, also, all orderings are valid. We need consensus that everybody agrees to that order, which is what we're doing over here. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, so consensus, of course, has many, many, many variants. So we're looking at a particular, uh, essentially, the idea of a, a, a agreement on, on log order, because we're just creating a log over here. OK, so let's see how this works. And uh, you know, so I'll just say, so basically, in the first round, we're going to get consensus within a superleaf over here. Each superleaf gets one consensus. And then the next round, we're going to do any arbitrary Byzantine fault-tolerant protocol, which is I'm showing over here, like PBFT or whatever. In fact, we plan to use Algorand uh, BFT, which is the most efficient BFT that we know of. And also, it helps that uh, Sergey Gobineau, who's an Algorand, is a co-author here. So, so we're going to use his uh, BFT protocol. And we're going to uh, do a BFT between these nodes. And after we've done that, we now have essentially everything we need to share the partial orders between these groups in a way that is Byzantine fault tolerant. So we just use Canopus afterwards. So after that, we just do our normal 
a secondary exit with BFT plus one, we get the quorum certificate, and then after that we just do our uh, consensus between the Byzantine groups using using Canopus. And so every inter-Byzantine group communication is accompanied by a quorum certificate that says this is what happened here, and we can prove it. And so, so that 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 happens over there. Um, I have a slide showing pipelining. This is nothing particularly cle clever. It just shows that basically the first round of the cycle one um, is going to be, uh, so these, these rounds are all pipelines. So basically the cycles are all happening in parallel. This, you know, so while, while one cycle is doing its Byzantine consensus, the other one is doing super leaf consensus on transactions, and the third cycle is just collecting the transactions is going to do this. So all of these are happening in parallel, and it, it just works. And then I have sort of an eye chart which is showing all the different faults that we can deal with. So there's 17 different faults, node crashes, and they, they can have different effects, uh, Byzantine nodes, superleaf crashes, partitions, Byzantine root crashes, et cetera, and basically we handle all of them. And uh, the details are in a paper which is on our website, so you can, you can actually take a look there. So <clears throat> I'm just going to end with a few insights into, you know, into this uh, that, that at least I found is interesting. The first one is what I call concretization, right? When you look at distributed systems uh, researchers and you know I, I, uh, theoretical distributed system researchers, uh, the 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 model that they use essentially is a graph model, typically graph or tree model, where all links have unit cost, and and this is a great model for for many things, but when we look at the practical world, we find that in fact. The, the uh, single link that is uh, inter data centers like 200 milliseconds and inside it rack is a few microseconds. It's you know, three, four orders of magnitude difference. And ignoring it is a big problem. And so what we're doing over here is we are kind of going from an abstract cloud or graph into an actual data center network. And I think that gives us a big performance win. That kind of points out that we need to do pipelining, for example. And it also refines the failure model because we can now talk about what is the failure model from a Byzantine attack. We don't just say F failures. We say, no, these data centers in this city could get attacked, right? Or, or this is what the group looks like. So I call this concretization. I, I made it up. OK, but I think it's a nice idea to have. We should not be too abstract. We should be thinking about the reality, what's actually going on. Because otherwise, you just get lost in the cloud, right? The second thing is communication efficiency is important. We need to exploit communication heterogeneities. The fact that you can use a P4 switch, which is a, a fast router, and there's a paper from earlier this year showing four billion transactions per second for consensus using hardware acceleration inside a rack. That is super important. That's showing you how you can exploit very high throughputs in, in, inside a rack, for example. So we want to exploit these kinds of hardware by looking at by exploiting communication efficiency. Inside a rack, you're highly efficient. Between racks, in the same data center, you're more, less efficient, but quite fast, and so on. So we want to exploit what we can. The lesson from peer-to-peer -peer networks is that the big peer-to-peer -peer networks never actually work properly. Right? If you look at CORD, it has a beautiful abstraction of, of a key space and you know, log in, finger tables, and so on. But the mistake they made was they said, well, we have finger tables or login fingers. But some of the links were milliseconds, some were microseconds, some were hundreds of milliseconds. And so what looks nice and clean mathematically in practice was terrible, right? Now, of course, people have refined it. And, 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 and Cord, you know, which has eventually become the basis for Cassandra, is really, really successful. But this ignorance of communication efficiency in peer-to-peer -peer networks was, I think, a big problem why many of the proposals that were made in the early 2000s and hundreds of papers published, almost none of them exist today. All the hype about peer-to-peer -peer networks has gone away. The other thing that's interesting is that the reason we can do pipelining is because you have repeated versus one-time consensus. If you look at classical consensus protocols, you have propose and accept. So you have everybody proposing a value, accept, over. That's it. You're not doing anything more. In fact, with blockchain, we have repeated consensus, which allows us to pipeline things. And so this repeated value uh, consensus, I think, is a, is a no, it's not new. We're not uh, saying that it's not been done before, but we can exploit it in a nice way. The other thing is uh, structured communication. The overlay tree I talked to you about has a structured communication path. So I know I have to go to this node and this node and this node in order to get the values I need to compute my partial order. With gossip, you don't have that. You just say, well, I'm going to randomly pick one of these nodes. So you don't have finality. And so while gossip is 
clever and it's useful. Uh, in some cases, we found that structured communication actually was a much better fit for what we were going to do. And finally, the, I, the idea of Canopus that I showed you, we sketched that on a whiteboard in 10 minutes in 2015 to actually deploy it and get the performance numbers took us over two and a half years. It's many, many, many things you need to worry about. And uh, in our initial implementation, we didn't have any pipelining. We didn't think about it. It's only when we started deploying it and getting results, we realized how important pipelining is, which I think is actually critical. <laughs> so going from idea to implementation is challenging, but, but very important. And yeah. You said structured communication often. It means it is managed. Managed so in the sense. Well, you, the, in our case, the, we, it's permission, so we know on the tree. It, it's, a, it's an overlay tree. Okay, so you know this in advance. You know this in advance. Again, in practice, if you have a permission blockchain, you know the members, right? So I know whom to classify into a Byzantine group and all these other things, yeah. So to finish up, there are some, still some ongoing work. We, 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 you know, we're still working on some of the final details of the Quinox protocol. We're doing integration hyperledger fabric. Uh, we actually re-architected hyperledger fabric. Uh, we can make it go quite fast. Uh, not fast enough for my, for my uh, satisfaction, but it's still quite fast. You can do about, at this point, about 11,000 transactions a second in hyperledger fabric by just re-architecting without using Canopus. Once we put it in, we can do even faster probably, and we, have, we still don't have correctness proof. We need to do that. Okay, so to finish up, so basically our Canopus is a Byzantine fault tolerance consensus protocol, at least a log replication protocol, which enables high scalability in permission blockchains. So we're again in the permission context, which is topology aware, and we're using the tree and any class based overly communication and uh, using batching and pipelining. And so we, we, we have few limitations I should point out. We, we, do, we do increase the latency to get the throughput, and that's a trade off you're willing to make. Uh, we don't know how to choose the hierarchy and then the details. Well, until we fully implement it, there may be some, some issues, but at least uh, so far, I think we, 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 know, we know where we're going. So uh, my hope is that we can uh, build this out completely. We are in the process of doing that. We can integrate that into Hyperledger Fabric. It will all be open source, so you know, people that are willing to, who want to use it are certainly welcome to use it. And, uh, uh, Canopus already is open source. It's uh, downloadable from, from our website, uh, but we will open source this as well. And, uh, you know, I think it would be very interesting to see if you can get blockchains to a million transactions per second or something in that vicinity. It opens up very many different uh, uh, avenues uh, for, for, for its use. And so this is something I'm pretty excited about. Okay, with that, I'll stop and take any other further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe here. <laughs> uh, well, very interesting. Uh, uh, high level question. Yeah. In some uh, blockchain uh, systems, most notably in uh, the context of Bitcoin, yes. uh, uh, an issue of concern that has been gaining, gaining growing attention is not that of malicious behavior, but of potentially selfish behavior. Uh -huh. That is, that the nodes may have incentives yeah. Uh, yeah. to defect from the protocol. Exactly. Now, if you here deal with uh, agreeing on the log of transactions, mm -hmm. uh, some nodes, or all the nodes, may have a preference to prioritize the mm -hmm. transactions, mm -hmm. that of mm -hmm. the customers, yeah. etc. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been thinking? Yes, uh, we have. Yeah, absolutely. The way we do it is basically to use the hash of the transaction as the random number, rather than the random numbers I talked about earlier. So, so uh, in fact, uh, if you just take the hash of the transaction and then you take the, I don't know, the, the hash itself as the random number, you can't gain that. So, so you get you get fairness. Yeah, I, I, it's one of the attacks. I, I do, it's actually one of the fine print things over here, but. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, somewhere here it says you can use a hash, but anyway, yes, we did think about that, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yes. So you use the abstraction of rack and data center and off data center, right? Yeah. Uh, is this kind of generalizable to, you know, no 
nodes that are randomly distributed, but not this kind of three? Well, so the, the, yes, the answer is yes. The important thing for us, and again, this comes from a lot of uh, thinking about it, is that we really rely on a, a single rack, literally a rack. And the reason is so because, the broadcast? because I need a single switch in order to assure myself that I can get a synchronous system. Okay and the high throughput that I need and the low latency. If I have two switches, then I have a queuing problem. Right? A single switch, you know, if I keep the utilization below whatever, 70%, 60%, then I have a really tight bound on latency for inter-server inter communication. Um, so is it like a, is it truly an atomic broadcast that you're looking for, or a synchronous broadcast, something like that? Well, once you get to a synchronous environment, then all of these are equivalent. Okay. It's okay. atomic broadcast, consensus, okay. all these are the same, pretty much. So you can use whatever you want. The, uh, me the 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 message we the sort of the uh, uh, call that we make is basically a distribute message, and then everybody's supposed to get it, or we know that some node has failed. So either you get uh, multicast or broadcast to everybody, and then the response comes back saying, and these nodes are dead, right? Which comes back from the API basically, and you can get that from any number of uh, things that you want. So we, we use Raft. We use, sorry, Zookeeper. In the Canopus, we use Raft. And for this one, we use Zookeeper because Zookeeper has some nice, nice things that we want. But Zookeeper in a synchronous environment is very, very fast, actually. Yeah. Yes? So you mentioned the correctness proof. Yes. I saw that one of the authors is Wojciech. Yes. Uh, normally, he's able to do the correct Yes, yes, yes. No, it's not, it's not that he's a, it's a question of able to. He's, uh, it's complicated, and he's working on it. Yeah, Wojciech is definitely more than able to do this. Yeah. Uh, From where comes the complexity of the, of of the proof? Uh, the complexity comes from actually the network partitioning part. I didn't even mention network partitioning, but when you have network partition, we need to make sure that the um, Majority partition makes progress and the minority partition stalls, right? So we need to prove that in all cases, the minority partition stalls. But the problem is network partition is not precisely defined in the distributed systems literature, right? So if I ask you what a network partition is, you can you understand what it is. But when you say, well, it, if it lasts for 10 microseconds, it's not a partition. But if it lasts for 10 days, it's a partition. Right, so we have this notion of an onset of a partition and the recovery from a partition. And, and, and modeling this correctly is actually quite hard. And so it has to do with the time scale at which we declare that a certain partition has actually occurred. Uh, and and um, yeah, it, yeah we, 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 are, we are still struggling with that. <laughs> I mean, so, so the, I mean, the problem is something like this, right? I, I, I have a, I have a, group, a Byzantine group, let us say, and the Byzantine group gets cut in half. There's a, there's a cut between uh, northern Paris and southern Paris. So there's some data centers in the north, some in the south. They can't talk to each other. So we call that a partition. But how do we know this is a partition? Well, we send a message, we get a response back. There's going to be message loss, right? So okay. So, but now the partition, depending on how long it lasts, it may or may not be a partition. Because if it lasts for, I don't know, two minutes and it gets recovered and you have a timer that's more than two minutes, then you don't see it. It come back and then you got it. So, so the problem is we don't know. So we want to make it network partition, to partition tolerant except from the theoretical literature, I guess as best I understand it, we don't really fully know how to define network partition in a, in a theoretically correct way. You work on uh, overlay, actually. Yes. Yes, yes, except those are not, um, uh, those are not going to be uh, recognizing the heterogeneity in the network communication. So we need expander graphs, which are also going to be careful about not using long distance links and so on and so forth. So, so again, that whole literature on graphs and expander graphs in particular <coughs> is completely oblivious to the cost of communication. So we're trying to be concrete, concrete at the same time as being correct. So it, it's a very fascinating problem, I think. Uh, and, and once you start getting into this, even these obvious things become very difficult. You don't know what it means. Even. What does a partition mean? I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, but yes, we are working on it. And I think it's a very open and interesting area. I'll just end by one thing, which is uh, 
My feeling is blockchain is an absolutely uh, a crazy area because next year it's going to be horrible. Everybody's going to say it doesn't work. It was oversold. It's, it's wrong. You should never have touched it. I can't believe anybody's working in this area. Everything that was said about the internet in 2001 will be true next year in blockchain. You can get no funding for it. You should get all the funding right now and put it in the bank and not spend. <laughs> because blockchain is going to be a dirty word in 2019, maybe 2020. So, but uh, however, I believe that by 2025, 2030, something like that, blockchain is going to be really quite transformative. I, have, I mean, this is my gut feeling, right? But this is the way I feel. That uh, it's going to be very important because it solves many problems elegantly in terms of the trust uh, infrastructure. So. Uh, but in the short term, uh, it, it has a very bad future. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll end with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.